I'd like to thank Rachel for encouraging us to clap during the first song. Uh, my family knows that for me, when it comes to clapping and singing, you only get one or the other. I don't know, is that true for anybody else? I lost the ability to do that several years ago, and I chose clapping this morning because you asked. It was my first leap of faith of 2024 was to clap roughly on beat for an entire, an entire song, so thank you for that. Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. Hope y'all had a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year, and it is back to the real world now, isn't it? So the number one thing that people long for, the number one thing that they have as a New Year's resolution is what? It has to do with their diet, right? Lose weight, get back on track. One thing that I had forgotten from last year, which was our first Christmas year, uh, but I was reminded of very much this year, is that Mandarin Presbyterian Church has some amazing bakers in the congregation. <laughs> it, it was like a Christmas parade of homemade fudge and baklava and cookies and rum cake and pecan sandies. It, it felt like it was some sort of you know, competitive but unknown annual baking competition around here. You know, you don't keep the score, but everyone knows who's winning, right? <laughs> now we all need to give each other veggie trays and treadmills for the next, the next month. Now, one of our favorite Christmas movies is Elf. Does anyone, anybody else enjoy Elf? Do you remember what the, the favorites or the four major food groups are for the elves? What is it? Candy, candy canes, candy corn, and what? Syrup, right? So this morning, we're going to talk about nutrition and what are we consuming. Nutrition and what are we consuming. So I want you to turn to your Bibles, if you haven't already, to Matthew chapter 4. You can follow along as I read our passage out loud. Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our passage is indeed about what we feed on, but aren't you relieved to know I'm not going to talk about diet food in this sermon. So those of you who are familiar with this passage, you may be thinking to yourself, doesn't Pastor Andrew know that this Bible story does not end here? And yes, I am aware of that. If you're not familiar with this story, the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, it goes on for another seven verses, and there are three temptations by the devil, but I want us to hone in on this first one because it focuses on this issue of sustenance, how we feed ourselves and what we feed ourselves. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. Well, in one sense, yes, we do. If we understand, as he says, his bread, that is including all physical food and drink, then yes, we absolutely need our daily bread to physically survive. But in another sense, there is other food that is essential. Because there is more to us than just our physical bodies, right? So the next two weeks, we're going to focus on what does it mean to feed our heart soul, mind in 2024. Specifically, what is your plan to be in God's Word? Cover to cover in 100 days, as we saw in the announcements earlier or heard, starts two weeks from this Tuesday. If you're going to do that, please register so that we know you're going to be there and we know we're ready for you. We already have over 350 people signed up. It's going to be amazing. Please know then I want you to do this with me. We're going to start on page one in Genesis. We're going to end on the last page in Revelation, and we're going to do this together. However, you do not have to do this. This is not a requirement for being a member of Mandarin Presbyterian Church or attending here or worshiping, her, worshiping here, but I believe it can change your life. 
and I believe it will change this church. And for some of you, this is the best chance you are ever going to have to read the whole Bible. So let's do it. Now, if you choose not to do cover to cover, I still love you. I'll still be your pastor. I'll still pray with you. I'll still eat your rum cake and pumpkin bread every Christmas. But if you're not going to join me in cover to cover, then my question for you is this. How are you going to be in God's word in 2024? How are you going to be in God's word in 2024? And that's the focus of these next few sermons. Get in God's word. Whether it's cover to cover or something else, we all need to be in God's word and in God's truth. So one of the things that I love about our passage this morning is that it names our enemy. It names our enemy. What's his name? We believe in a literal enemy devil and in this passage he actually gets three names the devil satan and the tempter each of those gives us a little perspective on the work that he does or tries in our lives as the devil it literally means the divider the splitter satan means the accuser the tempter points to the fact that he is the one who knows how to lure us off the paths of righteousness. He's like a master fisherman. He knows exactly what kind of bait he needs to draw us off of God's path. Our passage names our enemy. Do you ever wonder if the devil makes New Year's resolutions? Have you ever wondered that before? Is that just some weird pastor thing? Does the devil ever make New Year's resolutions? Well, I think if he did, it would sound something like this. The devil wants spiritually starved Christians in 2024. The devil wants spiritually malnourished Christians in 2024. He wants Christians who have shallow roots. He wants Christians who don't know what they believe. He wants Christians who don't know God's truth from the Bible. And do you know why he wants that? Because he wants easy prey. He wants easy prey. He is a predator, and he wants easy prey. I really struggled as I wrote this sermon because I didn't want it to feel too overwhelming, but I believe the stakes are very high in 2024. I think we are each going to be put to the test and we need to be ready. 2024 is full of unknowns. Every year is. We don't know what we don't know. Now what we do know is that our culture continues to get out of control. The world is in turmoil and at war and no one is going to let us forget that it is an election year. And you know what? The devil is licking his chops. He is licking his chops because he wants you and he wants me to be easy prey. Now who here remembers the old food pyramid? You remember they had the public service announcements. People came to the schools to talk about it. All you Gen Xers, you latchkey kid generation, you remember this from school, right? The USDA adopted the final version of it or the first version of it in 1992. And I want us to pause for a moment just to remember how much we used to love bread. I mean, look at that firm and doughy foundation of pasta and bread and oatmeal and cereal. I mean, the idea behind this all and all of its iterations that came after it is what? That it's important to pay attention to what food we are consuming on a daily basis. We need more of the healthy stuff. We need less of the unhealthy stuff, right? So the same concept applies to our heart, soul, and mind. The quality of what we take in, the quality of what we consume impacts the health of our thought life, our outlook, our attitude, our faith, our relationships, everything. So I recently read a book called The Wisdom Pyramid by Brett McCracken. 
In it, he focuses on this idea of how do we become wise people in a foolish age? How do we feed on wisdom and truth so that we can become healthier and stronger? And his thesis is essentially this, that we need a better diet of knowledge and better habits of information intake. To become wise, we need to be more discerning about what we consume. Now, here's how he describes the current situation in the opening paragraph. I want you to listen closely and see if any of this resonates with you. He writes, Our world has more and more information, but less and less wisdom. More data, less clarity. More stimulation, less synthesis. More distraction, less stillness. More pontificating and less pondering. More opinion and less research. More speaking, less listening. More to look at, less to see. More amusements, less joy. And I love this last one. Everyone has a megaphone, but no one has a filter. <laughs> Isn't that true? Everyone has a megaphone, but no one has a filter. What do you think? Does that resonate with you? Do you agree with that? So McCracken breaks down our information intake problems into three problems that mirror poor eating habits. He says this, we eat too much, we eat too fast, and we only eat what we like. We eat too much, eat too fast, and we only eat what we like. So I'm going to look at each of those. The first, we eat too much. So too much of anything makes us stick makes us sick, right? Stomach aches, indigestion, or worse. That's about how we feel after December, right? Too much information does the same thing, and nothing characterizes the internet age like information overload. So I want you to think about your phones. Don't take them out. Don't look at them. Just, just think about them. Have you ever looked at how many of your apps are currently sending you notifications? And how many more want to? This week, I went through that list in my settings to silence as many as I could and minimize the number that are essential notifications. Now, all of those apps, all of those apps on your phone... They're all competing with each other to get you to open them. It's like having a hundred demanding toddlers following you around, demanding that you do what they want you to do. They're all trying to get your attention. Commercials, TV, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, email, text, TikTok, Amazon, Disney, ESPN, you name it. How many of you have smartwatches? I have one. Have you ever been hanging out with someone and their smartwatch keeps getting notifications? Notifications that you can hear? Notifications that you can see? First of all, I apologize to everyone that I've done that to. <laughs> I turned those off this week. We are inundated with updates. We are inundated and force-fed information everywhere. You can think of this as the devil's strategy of overwhelming his target with numbers, to throw as much at us so that we can't slow down and sort through what's necessary and what's unnecessary, what's true and what's false, what's hopeful and what's depressing. We're overwhelmed by information, and by and large, is it nutritious? Is it helpful? So if we're thinking about the food pyramid, this would not be foundational healthy stuff. This would be like only eating Cheetos and gummy bears, which are two of my favorite foods. <laughs> but they're junk food. Imagine eating that all of the time. Of course, it's going to make us sick. We eat too much. We eat too fast. What happens when we eat too fast. Parents, what happens when your kids eat too fast? Don't answer that question out loud. We don't need to talk about that right now. 
bad things. Bad things happen. Think about fast food. Fast food is just one big shortcut, right? I want to eat now. I don't care what it is. Just give me something to eat and please let it be greasy. However convenient it may be, fast food is generally not the most nutritious, is it? Most of the best food, both in nutritional value and taste, is prepared and eaten slowly. It's the same with information. We live in a busy, a busy, rushed day and age, and we want information now. Now, have you ever noticed how whenever the media reports on something, it's as though it's the most important and scariest thing to ever happen? Right? Every election is the most important election in the history of humanity. Every breaking news story gets this full five alarm treatment that if you don't pay attention to it, well, you're an awful human being, you're a loser, and you're irrelevant because you're not as upset as they want you to be about it. And then what happens? Well, they get another one. The next week, if it even waits that long. That old major important thing, well, that disappears and something even worse comes up. And it's more extreme and important and essential for our survival. You see, our social media age, the internet age, it favors what is trending at any given moment. What's trending in any given moment. There's no incentive to actually ponder and reflect. It's, there's no incentive to actually think about what happened last week or last month, or even last year. The internet is all about now. It's short-term memory loss. Scholars have found that when we're intaking this kind of junk food information, that it's actually rewiring our brains so that our ability to think carefully and critically about incoming information is being eroded. Isn't that interesting? Like we're, we're taking in information so fast and so much that we're losing the ability to actually filter it or ask important questions about it. We eat too much, we eat too fast, and finally, we only eat what we like. I only eat what tastes good to me. Okay, so back to the Christmas season, back to the elf's pyramid, food pyramid, right? December becomes a month where I start out strong. The first couple of weeks, I, am, I have a, a moderate approach to the baked goods and the sweets that are coming in, but once I hit that week before Christmas, it's over. I'm done. I'm digging in. And the smorgasbord of my favorite culinary delights, the cookies, the fudge, the pumpkin bread. After all, it would reflect poorly on us if any of it went to waste, right? People made that. Now, a surefire way to die young is to eat like it's always December, isn't it? To only eat what tastes good to me. And so it is with our information diet. We want to eat what we like. We want to eat what we agree with. And in our individualistic choose-your-own-adventure world, the internet is built to do that. Google search. Social media algorithms. Recommendations from Siri, Alexa, Netflix, Spotify, Amazon, and that creepy artificial intelligence on your phone that finishes your sentences and emails. All of it is tailored to create this little consumer universe exclusively for you so that you get sucked deeper and deeper and deeper into it. McCracken has a phrase that caught my eye that said this. He refers to it as the malforming momentum of the digital age. The malforming momentum of the digital age. So malforming, malformed means misshapen, deformed, malnourished, distorted, twisted. In momentum, if you think about what momentum is, and you think about how hard it is to fight against it, that there's this momentum in the digital age to twist us into people that we're not designed to be. To twist us into malnourished, 
misshapen, distorted humans. We eat too much information, mostly bad information. We eat too fast so that we don't actually process it with discernment and wisdom. We eat only what we want. It basically creates one big pleasure island for each of us, luring us deeper and deeper into our own personal kingdoms of anxiety and ego. Remember what I said about the devil's New Year's resolution. He wants easy prey. Easy prey that are too fat from consuming too much information too fast and too faint from binging on the equivalent of cotton candy and Coca-Cola for information and wisdom. The malforming momentum of the digital age. Now, some of y'all with lighter colored hair, some may call it gray, but I'll just call it lighter colored, you're thinking, yeah, those young people on the Twitter and TikTok, they really need to pay attention to this. But let me tell you, this is an all of us problem. It doesn't matter if you're 16 and have never known life without TikTok, or if you're 80 years old and you love seeing pictures of puppies and grandchildren on Facebook. The devil knows exactly how to get you to go where he wants you to go. He knows how to lure us in. He knows how to leave the breadcrumbs. We have to pay attention. So it's the opposite of malforming. The opposite of malforming. Something that's healthy, beneficial, wholesome, nutritious. That's where we want to be, right? That's how we stop the momentum. And this is what McCracken proposes. He has his own version of the food pyramid, except it's focused on how we feed our heart, mind, and soul. I want you to look at this and notice what's at the top and what's at the bottom. So what should be our most significant source of information and wisdom? The Bible. What should be the least significant source of our information and wisdom? Social media, phones, technology. So my actual wisdom pyramid is admittedly upside down. How about yours? I'm absorbed in my phone, my iPad, my laptop, Sending and receiving emails, text messages, social media, news, books, games, whatever. The screens are mesmerizing and intoxicating and feel more and more necessary and indispensable, especially when I think about how to set up healthy boundaries. It's that momentum that he's talking about. We feel so caught up in it that it's all, it almost feels impossible to slow it down, impossible to contain it. Something will miss out on something. So our interest this morning and over the next couple of weeks is on that foundational level of information intake. How are you going to be in God's Word in 2024? How are you going to build your wisdom on the foundation of Scripture? How are you going to allow your thoughts, your appetites, your actions to be shaped by God's truth? To put it a different way, How are you going to amplify Jesus' voice in your life so that it's louder than all the others? How are you going to amplify Jesus' voice in your life so that it's louder than all the others? So let's go back to our passage from Matthew 4. Verse 1 says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. I'm sure some of you raised eyebrows at that. Would the Holy Spirit really do that? Would he lead Jesus into temptation? Well, yes, he can, and he did. 
God has the right to lead us not only into good, easy situations, but also into ones where we're going to be in conflict with darkness and with the devil. In fact, that's where most of our lives are lived. Think about it. Ephesians chapter 6. Put on the full armor of God, right? Ephesians 6 talks about putting on that full armor, not so that we can go to VBS or a church potluck, but it's so that we can fight the devil when he attacks us, so that we can beat back the darkness by shining our light. And every moment we spend in God's word, every moment we're spending in God's word, we're getting prepared to be deployed into spiritual combat. That's essentially what we do here week after week. When we come here to worship, we are spiritually fed and nourished so that when we go back into the world, we are strengthened to fight our battles. Now, most of you spend less than two hours on the church campus each week, which means you spend the rest of your time where? On the battlefield. Are you feeding on truth and information that will nourish you and make you strong? Or are you feeding on stuff that is wearing you down from the inside out? Are you feeding on stuff that is making you strong from the inside out? Or are you feeding on stuff that is destroying you and eating you away from the inside out? So we say this often here in the church that we want to be a church where each of us is moving closer to Jesus and deeper in his word day by day, week by week, moment by moment. Our enemy does not want that. Our enemy does not want you moving closer to Jesus. He does not want you being shaped by God's truth and God's word. If we go back to those three names from the passage for our enemy, they all speak to how he approaches each of us. As the devil, he is the splitter. He is the divider. He will do whatever he can to keep a wedge between us and our heavenly father and our savior, Jesus. As the accuser, he will say, you don't deserve this. Surely Jesus can't love somebody like you. I mean, look at you. You're a mess up and you know it. Constantly accusing and telling us lies. As the tempter, he knows how to dangle that bait in front of us to draw us away from the path of righteousness. He knows exactly what will prompt this and pull us away from Jesus? Remember, the devil doesn't have to convince us to do things his way. He just has to convince us to do things our way. The divider, the accuser, the tempter. He doesn't want us to be with Jesus. But here's the thing, no matter what season you're in, no matter how far off the path of righteousness you find yourself, no matter how much darkness is surrounding you, whether you are in the valley of the shadow of death, it doesn't matter. Jesus still invites you to come to him. He is always just one step away. Even though we feel like we may have wandered miles, Jesus is only one step away, and he's saying, come to me. Come to me and experience life. Come to me and experience joy. Come to me and experience my shalom peace. A peace that Paul says passes all understanding. In other words, it's a peace that doesn't make sense because it has nothing to do with our circumstances or what's going on in the world around us. It has everything to do with the fact that God is with us, that we belong to him. Jesus invites us to come to him. So each month, we begin with communion. Each year, we do the same thing. So 2024, the first worship service, we are taking communion together, and it's an invitation from Jesus to feast on him. 
This is the Lord's table. It belongs to him. He set it for us. He invites us to it. It isn't a fast meal. It took generations and generations and generations of God at work to bring this meal to us. It is not an easy meal. It required sacrifice. Jesus loved each of us so much that he chose to lay down his life and sacrifice himself so that he could call you his son and his daughter, so that he could welcome you into his family, into his kingdom. And so when the accuser comes to you and says, you're not lovable, you're not a child of God, you are not a son or a daughter, a co-heir with Jesus, God says otherwise. God's truth says otherwise. And so as we come to this table, Jesus asks, do you trust me? When the world is growing dark around you, do you trust me that my light still burns bright? When the world tells you that things are out of control and you've got to fight the world's battles on the world's terms, do you trust me to fight the way I have modeled for you and called you to? When it seems like the world is spinning out of control and you've got to step into it and you're going to be spinning out of control as well, do you, do you trust me with what it means to be at peace and at rest? Do you trust me, Jesus asks. Then come to my table and feast. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and he says, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Friends, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again, and he will come again. Let us pray.